Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 16th of February, 2024, we have a first-timer, St Stephen Hankins, and he's going to be tying some incredible parachute patterns for us. And later, we'll be talking about a new and old material in the weekly tip. For now, we're the BT's from Boise, Idaho. And uh, let me just review a couple of things for those new to the channel. We... Uh, have the website right here, btsflyfishing.com. If you want to contact us, you can go there. Email. We post the, the videos on the LBD channel on YouTube. And it's live streaming right now to Facebook. And you'll find us on Facebook at gretchen LBD. Anyway, for now, I'd like to... Uh, okay, there we go. Here's our lucky gentleman tonight, Stephen Hankins. And Stephen, you're muted, so you're going to want to unmute yourself before we start. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, about Stephen. He is a displaced or misplaced dry fly obsessive living in Oklahoma. He fishes the southern Colorado high country <clears throat> in the summer and the Ozark Mountain smallmouth and stalkers the rest of the time. That said, he loves big bluegill. Stephen has a small but flourishing fly tying materials company called Magpie Materials. I have put the uh, website address in the chat so you can go there and click and see what he's got. But as Magpie Materials, check out his website. His day job is in the child saving and life changing business while in his spare time, he's finishing a graduate degree at night. Wow, when do you find some time to even join us, my friend? You've got a busy life. Well, anyway, I'm going to let you back, get back to your life here in a short time. But for now, the vice is all yours. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And I uh, hope everybody's having a good Friday. Um, my disclaimer is that I'm not a professional fly tire. And I typically don't behave professionally on a Friday night. But I'm going to do my best for you all. Um so we'll just get with it. Let me, uh, and I'm, and I'm shooting, I'm doing this on my, uh, iPhone. And so I just want to make sure, is that clear enough for everybody? It's looking great. That that looks, do I need to move the camera any closer or is that? It's, okay, it's, it's good right there. If that's about the size of stuff that you're going to be tying. Okay. So, uh, like was stated, I am a dry fly junkie. Um, I like to fish dry flies when they're not eating on top. That's It's that bad. Um, so what I'm going to tie, I like to tie the classics and I like to tie parachutes. I end up fishing the parachutes much more often than I fish the classics, but uh, I always say I'm going to change that, but I'm a creature of habit and I tend to always go for the parachute. But um, anyways, I'm going to see if I can do better with that this summer. So I'm tying on a size 12. Uh, I'm tying a little bit larger just uh, so maybe there's a little bit more clarity on what I'm doing. Steven, is that the red quill that you're working on? Yes, sir. I'm going to tie a classic art flick red quill. Right. I've, I popped up the, the recipe while you continue to tie. Okay. So uh, what we're going to start off with is I'm going to prepare a wood duck feather. And, you know, as with fly tying, there's usually lots of ways to do something to accomplish a goal. So I'm going to show you the way that I do it. And so I strip all the fluff off the bottom of the feather. And we'll get a rough measurement as to how tall we want the wing to be. So I'm going to snip out the very middle of the feather. I'm sure you all are aware of this technique. And uh, I save these little uh, snip out pieces for the tails on my one of my favorite patterns, the uh, uh, Renee Harrop's Last Chance Cripple. So I always kind of set those to the side. And if the... If they, they don't blow off my desk, I'll have some ready for her when I tie those. So, uh, all right. So, I'm going to, that's going to be a little bit too fat of a wing. So, I'm just going to thin it down a little bit. And that looks pretty good right there. That'll make a nice full wing. Uh, I'm sure some of you, some of you guys are cat skill guys and uh, you might judge my tying tonight. So, I hope I do it some justice so that's going to be a pretty full wing i like the uh, uh, a flank wing to be a little bit full so i snipped that off so now we'll start our thread 
and again, I apologize for the sound quality and all that, but I'm on an iPhone. It's between myself and the device. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to make a fool of myself to some extent while tying live for y'all. So I'm not used to working around a, you know, a, a phone while I tie. So, but I've started the thread. The thread I'm using is Magpie Materials 72 Denier Gray. I choose gray because that's the color that really is going to blend in with the hackle color. Okay, so if I were to use a red, then the red thread base would stick out from the gray, the blue done hackle. So, but, so, you know, there's uh, a lot of consideration on a cat skill or a flank wing fly um, to set the wing back some for a space for some people say for the turtle knot and others argue for the balance of, of the fly. So I have it at about a third of the way back or so from the hook eye. So the next step is to fold the flank wing over the stem. And what I have looks like that. Okay, so I'm going to measure the length to about the length of the length of the shank. Um, it's going to end up being a little bit longer because I'm going to use a pinch knot or a pinch wrap. And the pinch wrap is one of those techniques that took me a lot of practice to figure out. So what I have there is the wing, which will stand up later. And I'm going to trim this off at an angle. So the neat part about that is we have a built-in taper. So I'm just going to finish off, cover that up, and I'm going to come back forward, and I'm going to stand up the wings. What I'm doing now is I'm spinning my bobbin counterclockwise to flatten the thread out. I do that quite often throughout a tie. Okay. So what I've done is I've jammed a few wraps right up against the base of the flank, the wood duck flank. Now it's stood up. I'm going to put just a couple more. Okay. Now I'm going to bring the thread back behind it. Now I'm going to separate them into two clumps. And that's why we uh, cut out the, the tip of the feather is so that uh, that would enable us to separate them into two equal bunches to separate the flank. Okay. That's good enough. I find I'm never exact uh, on making the two sides equal, but that, that'll work. So I put a figure eight between them. I'm going to spin my bobbin counterclockwise again. That, the reason I do that so much is it gives me more control. Um, and as you know, uh, whenever we've made a lot of wraps and our thread is spun, clockwise the thread whenever we um let it loose it's going to jump to the right okay and so the reason i do that i'm always mindful of that is so i have more control whenever the thread jumps to the left like that whenever i tie in materials okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to put a few whips around the base of each wing And this brings all the fibers together, all the barbs. Okay. So now we have them separated, stood up nicely. I'm going to snip that out because it's going to be problematic. And it's easier to snip it out than it is to try to save it and put it back into the wing clumps. So now I am advancing my thread back towards the bend of the hook. And now the tail that I'm going to tie in is a dyed done whiting CDL. And again, I probably put more barbs than needed. But one reason why I do that is I figure I'm going to lose a few barbs as I fish the fly. Although, you know, a CDL is a fairly durable material. I tend to go a little bit heavier than I need to. So the next thing I like to do is I like to trim the uh the rough butt ends of the the barbs that just makes it easier for us whenever we tie in so again i'm going to measure that tail to about the length of the shank
Okay. That looks okay. So now I'm going to tie down the, the butt ends back up towards the wings. Okay. Now, since we're tying a classic red quill, we're going to use a uh, strip Rhode Island red cape feather. Rhode Island red rooster cape feather. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with the Rhode Island red, but this is what the pelt looks like. Okay. Uh, sometimes when you have a furnacey Rhode Island red, sometimes the quills will be gray. Um, this one in particular still maintains a natural red quill. And um, the Magpie Materials Rhode Island Red quills, they don't need to be soaked. Um, they, may, they stay pliable. So I'm just going to strip off both sides, strip the barbs off of both sides of the quill. I'm going to make a giant mess on my desk in doing it. So whenever you tie a dozen of these, you really need to, you know, clean as you go. So occasionally you'll have a quill break, you know, and that's why it, it never hurts to soak your quills uh, and your biots, um, but especially the wild turkey biots, just they're, they're supple enough to where they don't need to be soaked. And uh, I'm sure that while I'm tying live for y'all, uh, it's probably not going to work out the way it typically does, but we'll see if it does. So again, to, make a smooth thread base for that quill. I've spun my bobbin counterclockwise to flatten the thread out. I'm just gonna work back forward, touching turns of the thread to about the point where we want to end the quill and tie in the hackle, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is just um, take slow, deliberate touching turns of that quill forward Don't get in a hurry here. Just one wrap at a time. And I think one more wrap will do it. So as you can see, I, I uh, applied pressure from my thumb and forefinger as I made those first securing wraps so it didn't come loose. Okay, so snip that out. Now we want a clean tie in point. So I'm going to cover up that butt end with thread. Spinning my bobbin again, counterclockwise. Okay. For the hackle, uh, I'm going to use a Whiting Hebert Miner. It's called the Unique Variant, but I call it a, a shade of kind of a shade of tan blue dun. The original calls for blue dun. So whenever we tie in a hackle, we want to tie in a bare stem. Okay. So again, a, a flat, smooth thread base will, will help us tie in a clean hackle. I have a little bit of a bump right there, and that's probably going to make a few barbs go a little bit wonky, but that's okay. So now I've moved my thread just in front of the flank feathers, the wings, and I'm tying that down. I'm going to make a few wraps back and forth in an effort to just smooth that off and increase the the diameter of the shank in front of the wings. You're never going to get the diameter in front of the wings the same as it is behind, but I find it helpful to at least kind of smooth it off, you know, make a smooth ramp. Okay. So, you know, some people like to tie with the color or convex side facing forward, some tie it backward. I tend to tie it forward. The reasoning why, I don't really know. That's just what I do. 
Um, you know, when you tie it backwards, that might give a little bit more color to the fish's perspective. Um, I just tend to like to tie it front, and I think that I get a cleaner barb wrap. The barbs stay a little bit cleaner and neater as a, if I tie with the convex side forward. So I made about three wraps behind the wings. I'm going to make four in front. And now tie it off. Three securing wraps. Now snip out the tackle. Okay. So now we'll take a look. I'm going to snip that barb out. Now we're going to clean it up and tie it off. Okay. And I, back in the late nineties, when I learned to tie flies, I learned to use a hand whip finish and that's all I've ever done since. I'm sure a tool is more accurate. And in fact, I've tried to learn how to use a tool before, but I just couldn't figure it out. So I, I continue to use my hands. So there we have our hand whip finish. I'm going to sneak my scissors in and trim off the thread, put out the thread. So there we have it. And I always, with my quill work, I like to seal the quill work. I use Sally Hansen, naturally. Um, there's plenty of other products out there to use, but I just find this easy. It's, I can run across the street and go buy it from CVS. Um, so I'm going to steady my hands and come in. And, you know, if you're tying several, it's a better idea to tie them in stages. You know, to do your bodies first, seal the quill and then go back and tie the, the hackles in. But anyways, then let me seal the knot. There we go. So that is my attempt to tie Artflix Classic Red Quill. Um, it's a lovely pattern. I like tying the old things, like I said, the old patterns. Uh, let me see if I can get a little bit closer. So... Yeah, that, that looks good. Any questions for Stephen? That's a beautiful job. Is there a way to show us a, a front shot so we see what it looks like going toward the fish? Sure. Um, again, the, the 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 camera quality. Hold on. Let me... Don't worry about that. That's okay. That's a very nice tie. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. There's just something about that pattern that really just really is kind of mesmerizing. You know, the the color with the the redness of the quill, the the blue dun tail and and hackle. It's a lovely pattern. So I do yeah. love a quill body. And beautiful, beautiful job on that. And and Gretchen commented yeah. off through while you were tying. The way you were wrapping the thread, she says, you know, he's wrapped it a couple of times before. <laughs> yeah. You do you you handle it well. Well, thank yeah, you. So here's the deal with that is I live in the middle of a fish desert in central Oklahoma, so I have more time to tie than you guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's no trout fishing near me. So all right. Um next I'm gonna tie. Uh, what are you going to the red parachute. quail parachute now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so same hook. This is a TMC 100, by the way, size 12. And now I'm going to switch thread color. By Mag the way, I comment again before you get started, Stephen. I comment yes. again that uh, I have your website posted in the chat for those of you who are interested in your materials. And most of what he's tying with tonight, including the thread, is on that website. Yes, thank you very much. Um, most of my materials are, I source myself, yeah. um, except for the, obviously the hackle. I, I haven't quite figured out how to grow rooster hackle yet, but maybe that'll be in my future. Oh, but, uh, you know, my, 
my biots, my the I road iron heads. Uh, I, I source them all myself, and the you know the dubbings, the biots. I prepare it all myself, package it, the whole thing. So it's it's really more of an extension of my fly tying. I mean, I'm just that big of a fly tying geek that you know I get that far into it. So, um, but anyways, I've attached my thread to the hook. Is it okay to drive the yeah. And, then you're going to take a and I also have a really good polypropylene yarn take a for sale on my side. Uh, I don't want to pitch pitch you all to death, so I'll just uh, leave it at that. But I vet every material that I provide. I spend lots of time tying with it, fishing with it before I, you know, decide to market it. So, so what I've done is I find the easiest way whenever you have your polypropylene in that format or even if it's spooled, just to cut a, a good length off. Then I can take my bodkin in and first half it. Okay, I'm going to set that to the side. Now, for my like, uh, that's still a little bit too thick, so I'm going to take just a little bit of that off. Okay. I set that to the side too because I'll do this enough uh, tying throughout the week that I'll have plenty of posts saved up. So, again, there's, there's several ways to accomplish a goal when tying. Um, the way that I construct a parachute, you know, I like to lay the, the clump right along the shank. Others prefer to tie it perpendicular to the shank uh, in, with X wraps, and that's fine too. I think some people even come under. But the easiest way, and this builds a very durable post, is lay it lengthwise along the shank. I'm doing a pinch wrap because that keeps it in position right where I want it. It's not going to move when I do a pinch wrap. Do about five wraps to secure it. Now, this is another thing. Um, I've never used the gallows tool. I, I believe that it can be helpful to do that. Um, but it's all just in the amount of pressure that you apply to build this post. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is put about four or five wraps right up against the right side. Do the same right behind on the left side. And what that does is it not only stands it up for us to prepare to, to finish building the, the post, but those wraps on both sides create durability. Okay, it essentially locks in the post. Okay, so now this is, I think that this is the secret. So you have your hand, your material hand on the side. I think that polypropylene yarn is probably the best material for, for parachute posts. I like to tie with turkey flats too. But I think that the durability, I pretty much tie with natural materials all except for my parachute post and a few other things. But so whenever you're standing that post up and building it, the technique is that you apply a good amount of pressure like I'm doing right there. And that locks your thread into that clump. Okay. So now you can see I've removed my material hand. And because that thread is essentially locked into that clump, I can just take wraps upward. Yeah. Okay. Now, it just depends on how much hackle you want to use. And that, that determines how tall to continue wrapping that parachute post. Okay. I, I end up with usually four to five wraps, sometimes three. So I've worked the thread back down. As you can see, that's a durable post. Like I've, I've never had a post that ever came undone or malfunctioned while fishing. Now I'm putting a few more wraps right up against the base of the post. And that that's locked in. That's never going to fail. So um, before I continue, does anybody have any questions on how I built that? I, and the reason I ask is I, I see it's a common struggle building that parachute post. Um, people, some people use super glue and things like that. It's just not necessary. Whenever you 
figure out the right amount of pressure to apply to it with your thread. So I'm going to tie in the tails. Again, I'm spinning my bobbin counterclockwise to flatten it out, give me control. Again, the reason to do that is so that the thread will jump to the rear, like that. And you can see that. That gives me control. Okay. Now that's a pretty good length. I should have trimmed it up a little bit more before. Okay. Now, another little technique is that you can actually spin that post and get it out of your way while you build the rest of the fly. Okay, and I like to add just a little bit of a taper. And since we, you know, we didn't, there's a way that you can tie in your polypropylene yarn and not do two sides and stand up the way that I did, but you just tie it along the hook shank like you would any other material. And that, that's a good way to build a, a taper too. But I find that just going back and forth to build a taper manually is just as good. It doesn't take quite so long either. Okay, so now I've advanced my thread back to the tail tying point. And I have a buyout somewhere around here that has jumped off my desk apparently since I've been tying. So I'm sure you all don't have any problems with that. Um, let's see here. Okay. Well, I seem to have misplaced the strip that I was going to use originally. And I don't want to waste any time digging for it. So I'm going to, I have this other buyout strip on my desk. And this is a new color that I've dyed. Um, Pink Albert is the name of it. So it's it's close enough to the to the rusty colored red quill that I would use anyway. So I'll just roll with that. So I've stripped the individual buyout from the strip. Um, and now to clean up the buyout before we tie in, snip the majority of that the butt end off. Okay, and as you can see, the, the that's a pretty wide wild turkey buyout. The beauty of that durable post is that you can jam stuff right up against it. It's not going to foul that post like it would a flank wing. But just to show you all what you can do with these, I want to do that. So I'm going to trim that down. And as you can see, there's a translucent side. And then we have our rib side. I like to tie the rib side out usually, especially on bigger flies, because with the wild turkey biots, it has a natural barring to it. And that natural barring adds a really beautiful color variegation. So, but again, you know, you can also tie with the smooth side, the translucent side showing, and that's, that makes a good segmentation too. So I'm just taking my scissors and real carefully trimming that translucent side down. So you've decreased the, the, the width of that biot. Okay. So that's a handy little trick. And so the tie-in, I think, is another trick that's important. Um, you know, usually you would tie in a material lengthwise along the shank. Now, with the biot, you know, they, they, especially the store-bought ones from the big companies, they have the tendency to be brittle. Okay. And if you tie in a biot the natural, in the natural manner, you have to fold that buyout over itself for the first wrap. Okay, and I'll demonstrate that. So the normal way to tie in a buyout, as you can see, it has to fold over itself. And that fold will create a, a weak point in the buyout. Okay. So the technique to counter that is to do an X wrap. And I'll show you what I mean. To stand the biot up in the plane of the first wrap so you eliminate that crease that fold over itself is you put one wrap over it and you'll come in with your thread and do an X wrap back over it. See how it stood up the biot. And by doing that again, you've eliminated that crease. You didn't fold the biot over itself. So the first wrap 
will not create a potential weak spot. Hope that makes sense. Okay, now, in another effort for durability, here's one of the few times that I do use glue. Um, and this is Gorilla Glue. Gorilla Super Glue. It doesn't take much. In fact, that's way too much. So let me remove some of that. Um, glues, here's the thing is I'm not so convinced that the majority of the glues out there actually stick biop to polyester thread. Um, just whenever you have some time at the vice, try it. Uh, tell us what you think. You know, tie a fly and then go back in and try to remove it and see. Tell me how easily it peels off. But I found that this Gorilla Super Glue seems to be the best at it. So I think the best, one of the best tools out there to wrap a biot is just a good old English hackle plier. You need a good tool to wrap a biot. Okay. So making the first wrap at the tying point of the tail, and I'm going to tie forward. And you can uh, increase the width of each tie or decrease the width of each tie, the space between each tie, however much you want to get the effect that you're looking for. Okay, so the closer the, the wraps are to each other, it'll be darker because of the natural barring of that biop. Okay. So again, this is my Pink Albert biop. I recently, this is really the third version of the Pink Albert. Um, the first one was junk, I'm not going to lie. Uh, the second one was a good color, but it was on a natural, uh, unbleached biot. Um, and so the third version is on a bleached biot. Uh, the bleaching reduces the prominence of that natural black barring. And so for lighter colors like this pink or the my PMD biot, it just lends itself a little bit better. Okay. So I will zoom in on that if I can. That's what we look like so far. You can see the rib side sticking out of that biot. Um, you know, the, the pink Albert, uh, I'm not going to try to butcher the Latin names for you all, but uh, we have the Pink Albert. We also have the Hendrickson. Um, so anyways, that's a biot that I'm proud of, but I finally got to a good color. And also, speaking of that, is my, I don't know how many y'all are in the Catskills or on the eastern side of the country and you fish Hendrickson's, but this is another material I put a lot of effort into is to getting a good pink color. And this is my fine beaver dubbing. Um it's low guard hairs. It's it's not completely free of guard hairs. It has a few still, but this is just a phenomenal clean dry fly dubbing. I, I like to think of this as the natural version of super fine. Okay. So I'm just gonna and, and you know the I find that the thinner thorax you have on a parachute, the cleaner the hackle wrap will be and the closer the hackle will be to the body. And that's what I want personally in my flies. Just because that, that brings the fly a little higher up in the water on the, on the film, you know, because it's closer to the hackle, which suspends it in the film. If that makes sense. So that's the thorax dubbing behind the parachute post. Um, and now what I'm going to do in is tie in my hackle and I'm using the same feather as as I did on the first one. So I'm also a hackle junkie. David knows that. Uh, I'm a connoisseur, I'll say. So anyways, that's a really nice, done, colored Hebert Minor Feather. I like Collins. I like it all. I like Mets. So I'm going to strip away some of the barbs and have a bare rachis or stem to tie in. Now, when you want the color facing downward on your parachutes you have the color facing you as you tie it in either the color or the convex side facing you 
Okay, so with the first couple wraps, you can now measure the length of the tie-in. So as you can see, I have bare stem that I'm going to tie all the way up that parachute post. Okay. Now I'm going to finish tying off the rachis to the hook shank. Okay. Now a little bit more dubbing. Again, it doesn't take much. Think of it as a just the lightest little wisp of dubbing. Uh, I think AK would say just enough dubbing to color your thread. Okay. I need a little bit more than that. And as you can see, that's why I named it Fine Beaver Dubbing, just for that. You can see how tight of a clean of a body that you can get with that dubbing. It's really pretty remarkable stuff. And, you know, beaver dubbing is nothing new, but it's just the way that, you know, I'm able to prepare it with minimal guard hairs is what makes it pretty special. Okay. So I'm going to begin wrapping that beaver back towards the post. Okay. Now, here's another technique that I use. Um, I invert the hook, or not invert, but I... Uh, you know, I reposition the hook in the vise, and to do that, you have to have your thread hanging essentially on the back side of the post, and here's why. So I've secured the fly, you know, the intersection of hook, thread, and post in my thumb and index finger. I've loosened the jaw, and I've repositioned it. And so that's the importance of positioning your thread on the back side of the post so that it can hang there. What would happen is if your thread was on the front side, it would fall and it would undo your dubbing work. Okay. So now the next step is to spin my bobbin counterclockwise again, flatten it out, make a smooth, flat base on which to wrap that hackle. Okay. Okay. Now I'll come back down, and we are ready to hackle it. So I have pulled the bobbin back out of the way. It's really just hanging on the side of my vise. You can't really see it. And here's another technique to position your hackle the way that you want it. Really, you know, depending on the rachis itself, if it's a very flexible rachis, you can still go back and tie concave down if you want it it's your fly um there's merits to both um i tend to tie color down uh, or concave down so again it's really in how you rotate that rachis to get the hackle to do what you want it to again some some hackles some rachises are just kind of unruly and they do what they want but this one is working with me so i've again i've rotated it like that, and I have the color facing to the left, which is going to be down, facing down. So, one wrap. And then here's another important point. So, I will see if I can zoom out. So, you want to maintain that. You don't want to twist the hackle as you wrap it. If you maintain that, I don't know the word, um, basically just don't twist it as you wrap it. So if you maintain it just like that, it'll wrap cleanly. Okay. Two, three, four wraps of hackle. That's enough. So now the tie off. I tie off to the parachute post. One, two, three wraps. Now we'll sneak our scissors in, trim that off close. Be careful we don't cut your thread. Try to zoom out a little bit, okay. So now we whip finish to the parachute post itself. Um, if you notice those uh, kind of errant barbs right there, we can actually clean those up and force them back into the rest of the hackle as we do this.
So a hand whip finish, come around all those barbs. Three, we'll do one more just for good measure. Okay. Now, grab your bodkin and seat the knot. Tighten it up a little bit. Okay. Snip off your thread. Trim your post to the length that you want it. There's our parachute. So now uh, sealing the thread wraps. Um, I don't put any sealant on my parachute uh, whip finish about half the time just to kind of see if it ever comes unraveled. I can't remember a time that it ever did, but it never hurts just to put a little drop right on that knot. And to do that, I put just a little drop on my bodkin. And there we go. That is how I tie a parachute. And I, again, that's kind of my, nice. that pattern right there. You can that adjust. That is the absolutely ties. gorgeous. Nice. Yeah. You wow, can adjust fantastic. the size and the colors of this to match any mayfly hatch. Uh, you know, you can, the wild turkey bites are just long enough that you can usually wrap a big Daiichi, what is it, the 1280 2X long hook or 3X long hook. Um, you know, you can do the same thing, just modify your hook size and your colors down and tie a small BWO. So it's a really good pattern. That's how I do it. Again, there's lots of ways to, to, to tie a parachute, but that's just the way that I've settled on over the years. So, well, I think uh, maybe I've portrayed myself as a fly tying junkie well enough tonight uh, that we felt the need that we needed to uh, build a support group for other fellow afflicted fly tires. Uh, it's a Facebook page and it really, um, as you can believe it, it backfired and we really just encourage each other to buy more hackle and tie more flies. So it didn't really help us out. But anyways, uh, all jokes aside, it's just a good group. It's a face. It's a, it's a private Facebook page that we made. It's just a good group of fly tires. There's no nonsense there. Um, you know, we all, we all just love this craft and we love catching fish on our flies and, uh, it's a good group of guys. So if you want a little community, uh, share your flies with us, watch other guys, what they post. It's just, a, it's, it's a fun way to, you know, to connect with other fly tires. That's how I've been in communication with Mr. Buckner. Uh, a lot of other really good, really great fly tires on there. So if you're, if you're interested in joining a good Facebook page, which, uh, you know, maybe that, uh, is a paradox, but you know, Again, jokes aside, is it's a good group of guys. To the weekly tip, and I'm going to be talking about an, a new material to many of us. It's a material that I've known about for, well, since the early 80s. Uh, in fact, my adventure with this material started when I went to my first fly fishing show, when I saw my first fly casting demonstration, and when I saw my first fly tying demonstration, all of which happened, you know, more than 20 years after I started tying commercially. And that show was a uh, Federation of Fly Fishermen at that time in Spokane, Washington. And uh, that's where I met people, that, three people that influenced me probably more than anyone as far as my time in the fly fishing industry. And that's Wayne Llewellyn, uh, <laughs> Dr. Dick Nelson, and on the casting side, Mel Krieger. But anyway, what really I really wanted to dig into tonight <laughs> was... Uh, Having met Dr. Dick Nelson, uh, I looked up to him as just a phenomenal fly tire, as I did I did and do Wayne Llewellyn. But okay, Dick was okay. kind of the guy that was way up above me. And so I always watched and smiled and spoke when I saw him and all that stuff. But I got to know his son, David, really well, and we got to be good friends. David is also a doctor. He introduced me to a product that he tied with starting in the 80s and all the way through until uh, recently, I published that particular material in the most recent issue of Fly Tire Magazine. If you look at our Tips and Tricks 19 in that magazine, number nine and 10 are about an athletic pre-tape. Now, what is athletic pre-tape? Well, 
I'll show you what it looks like on the hook. Here's just a piece of red that I, I just wrapped on the hook. I want you to notice that back here, it's uh, shaped a little different than it is here. And it was all shaped out of that right there. And you can see that that is just a kind of a thin, stretchy sort of a foam. It's tape that go, it's tape that's wrapped around the person's body before the heavier tape is wrapped in place. And uh, so where do you get it? Well, I've had, I've, I got more comments on this particular article and questions from people on where to get it, how to use it, and all that stuff uh, than, than I've gotten on anything that we've published in the last 20 years in that particular column. And um, anyway, where you get it, God, where else do you get it? Amazon, right? And, and in fact, this is the page on Amazon where I got it. And you can see right there above the picture of the of the foam and those those rolls of foam. It said last purchased June 24th, 2023. Well, that, that's my order. And uh, in fact, if you'll go into the chat, I put the in the chat, I put the Amazon affiliate link that'll take you right to that, right to that page. But back to the cameras, let's take a look at the actual material itself. There it is, just laying there. There's so much of it that I got in that package that my camera won't from one side to the other but this is what it's like it stretches stretches like crazy you cut it with the scissors in fact it's so fine it's easy to get going in the wrong direction well as you'll find out it don't really make any difference so let me go back over to the vice and i'll show you just what i mean by that here i'll get this hook out of the vice the one that's got the red on it and what i'm going to do is use a a couple of strips of the of the can. In fact, you can see I've got these tapered so that they're bigger on one end and little at the other end. Well, you don't need to do that. Here's a couple that are not tapered. They're just the same width all the way through. And I'm going to show you just how I wrap that particular foam. Let me get this out of the vise. We'll put a hook in the vise. And I'm going to use black thread because there'll be very good contrast between my uh, material and the thread, just so you can see the relationship. I'm not tying a fly or anything. I'm just going to show you the different things that you can do with this material. And this is interesting enough that I plan on having a full BT fly tying Friday um, just the whole thing on nothing but this material and the different ways to use it because it makes some incredible extended bodies and, and a whole lot of other things. It takes dye very easily. In fact, David Nelson, Dr. David Nelson, the one that introduced me to this, he would dye it in a coffee cup in the microwave. I mean, so it's it's real easy for the hobbyist fly tire to make small batches where, anyway, it's easy, easy to do. Let me just wrap this thread forward and get it out of my way. And I want you to notice that I'm leaving bare hook with thread wrapped over it. Because you can smooth, stretch this stuff out and make it like floss. And that, that black thread will show through. As you wrap that. Or, I'm coming up in here, making a, a fairly smooth body. Now I'm just going to come back here and I'm going to wrap an ant body just for the heck of it. And to do that, I don't pull it neck tighter, I pull it looser. Oh, wait a minute. I could pull it tighter though too, couldn't I? In fact, I could twist it. I could twist it into a rope. That's what I'll do. I'll twist it into a rope to start out. And you notice how that's kind of building up into the rounded ant body that I'm looking for? And I'll make it twist it up just a little bit more. Okay, well, now I want to smooth that up a little bit, so let me untwist it and wrap over that. Wow. And there we've got a, an application that's done just by twisting and, and turning around and so forth to end up with what looks sort of like an antibody. If you want to, you can. it can easily take uh, colors of felt-tip marker. If you're worried about it sinking, you can seal it with UV glue. I mean, the options are 
incredible with this material, but it's something I've never used in my commercial business. It's just one of those things that I knew about and sometimes would do on my own flies, but 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 did not use it commercially. Well, there's a yeah. lot of really good options in that material right there for uh, for the hobbyist fly tire. Here's examples of stuff that I dyed out of this white. And I dyed two colors. And then I found that I could get all those colors already dyed. It. I didn't have to mess around with the dye. So anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't do it. But these are colors that you can dye yourself. And it, I cannot believe if the stuff even gets near the 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 dye bath it just goes and it's it's dyed i mean it's yeah. so it you just dip it in take it out rinse it in cold water and you're done so it's none of the soaking and none of the fixing and all that kind of stuff that you normally have to do rent dye works fine but i don't care everyone uh we sure enjoyed you um getting with us tonight this is the special time of the evening where we all get to share with each other and we're going to start this evening um with my good friend evelyn Okay, here we go. There's the first one. That's the first fly. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the second one. Oh, marvelous. Love it. Good job. You know, well, Evan, when we start working on our next book, we're going to contract you to do <laughs> still in artwork for us. <laughs> Number Under that and I'll buy it from you, Evelyn. <laughs> Well, that's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, Jack Gillis is going to be joining us. Look forward to that. Take care now.